Welcome to Charter California Edition. My name is Brad Pomerantz. We are joined by Charles Calderon. He was a member of the California State Assembly and Senate, two different stints. He is now a candidate for Los Angeles County Superior Court Judge. So I want to speak with you first about your tenure in the legislature. You served from 1982 to 1998 in the Assembly and Senate and then came back for six years in the Assembly from 06 to 12. Tell us about those two eras. Completely different. Right, right. My first uh, stint in the legislature was pre-term pre limits. Right, right. And my next stint right. was post-term limits. Right. And, it, and it, um, it changed the legislature uh, in significant ways, uh, but not in a ways that term limits was designed to right. work. It was supposed to create a citizen legislature. But what it did is it simply made um, you know, the special interests more and stakeholders more powerful and staff members more powerful because, um, you know, if you're in there for, f at, after four years, you're, you know, people start asking, what are you going to do next? And right. a, lot of, a lot of legislators are thinking about their next race. Right. And so, um, it's interesting, many folks who had been big supporters of term limits in the 90s came to realize that maybe it wasn't working as effectively as they hoped. And part of the reason was, what I have heard is that it's the, uh, the particular law that was passed, having only six years in the Assembly, only eight years in the Senate, it was hard to become an expert in anything. Exactly. Um, interestingly, the legislature's term limits has been reformed. It's now 12 years in either body. Either, yes. You've got 12 years to spend. How do you want to spend them? But there were two different places when I, when I ran uh, in 1982, right. um, for me it was like a calling uh, oh. in the sense that, you know, we, you know, if you, you're from that era, you remember the, the assassination of John F. Kennedy, oh, sure, yeah. uh, and I was at the um, Ambassador with, Hotel with when Robert, Robert Kennedy. Wow. I was a, a student in high school, I didn't know senior, that. Wow. and um, and 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 so to me it was to it was to accomplish what they represented and what they wanted to do and 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 you know even though uh, voters many generally would complain about politicians uh, th there was a respect for their representative afterwards uh, that lessened significantly and I think the institution lost um, a lot of its uh, what it needs to govern and that is symbolism at the same time there are now and I'm think I got the count right three members of the legislature whose father served in the legislature. We have Chris Holden, mm -hmm. whose father, Nate, was a state senator. We have Sebastian Ridley Thomas, whose father, Mark Ridley Thomas, was in the legislature. We also have a young man named Ian Calderon. I know him. He is your son, <laughs> who is now in the state legislature. And I have to say, um, the early reviews on your son are quite strong. How does that make you feel? Proud. Yes. Because uh, when he was elected, he was elected at 27 years right. old with relatively little experience. Right. He had I mean, worked for a member. He'd worked for a member for right. two years. And, mm -hmm. um, but, um, and so, you know, you know, people would speculate, whisper, right. he's sure. too young. He's, um, you he know, the, he's spoiled. Right, he has the blessing or curse of good looks. Yes. Which can play one way or the other. But when he, uh, when he, when he came to me, he said, Dad, I, I want to serve in the legislature. And I, and I asked him why. He says, because I want to help people. Mm -hmm. I said, uh, how do you know that? He says, well, for the last two years working as a field representative, mm -hmm. I realized that's really what I want to do. Interesting. So, so, he, uh, so we, I told him, I said, if you make this decision, you've got to be fully committed, not only to winning, but committed to the people who, right. who elect you. And he said, I will do that. And he's done that. And if you think about his district, which was your district, you know, there's some well-heeled areas, but there are some areas that are challenged. So there's no doubt that constituent services in that district is at the 57th. Is that the number? I'm not yeah. sure the number. I mean, it, they're for real. Well, I'm proud of him. He's got right. he's got good values, and and that's what you need in politics, so you don't lose your way. And I've always told him, you know, they'll pull you in many different directions. And if you ever feel lost, just remember your basic. Yeah values and they'll they'll lead you out and he's done it and and people rave about him in sacramento nice i mean feel nice. from from, right. from assembly sergeants to lobbyists to right. other members 
uh, to stakeholders that go in to, to lobby him, right. you know, on a particular issue? I remember when Eric Garcetti was elected mayor, the first person I emailed was his father. And I said, I am most happy for you, Mr. Gil Garcetti. And the response back was so genuine. And so I get it. I get how you feel. I mean, the pride you must feel is just overwhelming. You are now looking to take a new step in your life, yes. open a new door, and you are looking to become a judge in Los Angeles County. I think a lot of folks may not realize that in the state of California, there are two paths to become a judge, the appointed path or the elected path. Either path works. You're running for office as a judge. It, it's, some would think that's odd, but talk to us about the process of running to be a judge, looking for votes. Well, in the first place, every judge has to run for election. Though, ultimately, yes. Ultimately, yes. those those judges that are appointed, they're usually appointed to fill out exactly uh, a, a, some judge who has left office right. to Retired. fill out their term. Right. And so, so it, either way, it's right. an election. Um, well stated. I've always, um, I've always, um, I've always been privileged to represent. Right. This community, every time I've gone to the voters, they've given me their r support. Right. And so I'm going back to them again in this capacity because uh, I, I think I have something to offer as a judge. Right. And folks may not realize, but you're, I mean, you're a lawyer. And you practice law for some time. I mean, there was a nice chunk of time between your two stints in the legislature where you were practicing law. I mean, bona fide. And you mentioned you were doing constitutional law. I mean, that's pretty yes. heady stuff. And environmental law. And, and I'd started out as a prosecutor. Pre-1982. Yes. Before I went to the legislature as a prosecutor, I tried 85, 90 uh, I didn't know that. jury verdicts um, right. or, or cases to, right, to, to verdicts. Right, to jury, right. And, um, and that was public service as well. Right. And so my whole life has been public service. And, um, and I have a lot of experience um, that I think I can bring to the bench. And, and impact people's lives in a significant way. Um, probably there's no other, um, oh, yeah. or few other offices that, that, that connect to people and the voters so closely yeah. because they walk in with, with conflict. And as a judge, you're fair and objective um, and you, you try to be just and you try to find a resolution to the case. I uh, used to be a lawyer, as you know. Yes. Uh, and after my last year of law school, I worked for a judge. I did a judicial clerkship. You've heard of those. Yes. For a federal court in uh, Denver, Colorado. And that one year experience really opened my eyes to American justice in the best sense and how lucky we are that we live in America and we have fair and impartial methods to met out justice, be it civil or criminal. And so I honor you for looking to take this bold step because like you said, sir, you're dealing with people in conflict, civil or criminal. That's not easy. It's weighty. No, it's, um, it's very difficult because um, everyone deserves their day in court. Right. Not everybody gets it because they don't have access to the courts. Right. That's another issue. Um, yeah, we know talk, about that. I mean, yeah, about I mean that. boy, the last few years have been rough for the uh, Judicial Council. Yeah. We know that the legislature's had to cut hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars, hundreds of millions of dollars, I think it was. But when they walk into court, right. they're entitled to their day in court. And whether, um, whether they're successful right. or unsuccessful, uh, they have to feel that it was fair. And that's the judge's responsibility, and that's the glue that holds our laws together. In the legislature, you can pass laws, but as a judge, you're going to implement them. I couldn't agree more. His name is Charles Calderon. He is running for Judicial Office Number 48 for the Los Angeles County Superior Court. My name is Brad Palmer. We'll be right back on Charter California Edition. How many appellate districts operate in the state of California's judicial system? Four, six, eight or ten. The California Courts of Appeal are divided into six appellate districts based on geography. Some of the appellate districts are further divided into divisions. 
Welcome back to Charter California Edition. I'm Brad Pomerantz. We are joined today by Mike Spence. He's a member of the West Covina City Council in the San Gabriel Valley. And sir, we know well that cities throughout the region, including and especially the Inland Empire, have faced tremendous challenges under the weight of pension obligations. We know San Bernardino declared bankruptcy. Its mayor said in large part because of pension obligations. Whether that's true or not, it's another conversation. But talk to us about the weight of pension obligations on municipalities. Well, you don't have just San Bernardino. You have Stockton. You have before that even Vallejo. Right. I mean, you've had some cities that have been impacted. In fact, every city that is part of a defined benefit program like CalPERS uh, has, has issues. And in fact, CalPERS says that they're underfunded as far as the liabilities, and they've asked cities to increase the amount of money that comes out of their operating budget to go for pensions, in fact, for people that no longer work for the city. What's, you know, remarkable, long gone. Right, what's remarkable to me is how much and what percentage pensions can take of a city's budget. I learned from your current mayor that one third of the budget of West Covina goes to retirement benefits. Is that right, sir? Yeah, right. Yeah. I don't think that people on the street realize that. No, in fact, there was an initiative in San Francisco where they were trying to trim uh, pension benefits because it was taking up, it was going to be, uh, you know, they projected out that approximately 90 cents eventually of every, do 90 cents of every dollar would end up going to pension. 90 cents. Eventually. And so they were worried because then you don't have money to run programs because you're right. busy paying retirees that for the most part have already done, they've done their job. Of course. And they're gone and they're living in Nevada or wherever they're living. <laughs> it's <laughs> tricky, the benefits. it's tricky though because we do know and the studies kind of conflict on this question, but as a general proposition, proposition, it would appear that in the private sector, you can make more money than in the public sector, but the private sector's lure has been traditionally outstanding benefit packages, pensions, health care, et cetera. If we start to strip back those benefits, does private sector employment become less attractive? I really don't. I, I think it is less attractive than public employees because I think I think those studies now it, I think it used to be that way. Right. But now it isn't that way. It's not it's not uncommon to have people you know at especially the top rungs making over a hundred thousand dollars, two hundred thousand. There's teachers that that on their W twos get more than a hundred thousand dollars. Right. And so I mean so I think that's no longer there. And then of course you have the the difference is in the private sector even though there's lots of problems firing someone. That is so much easier than it is in the public sector. In I the understand. public sector, you also have job security, you know, and that goes a long way. The private sector, even if you're making more money, well, where's your company going to be in two years? Right. You know, the city's going to be there, school districts are going to be there, public agencies, uh, you know, name me one that has gone away. And we do know that the private sector is starting to pull back on its benefits. So one could argue if the private sector is pulling back, the public sector can respond in kind. If salaries are on par, which they may be, you know, yeah. it's hard to know which study to rely upon. Yeah, well, well, there's some functions that are different, obviously, but right. I, th I think that is true. And I think, you know, private sector has already done away, for the most part, the kind of pension benefits right. that public agencies got. The defined benefit where you're going to make X amount a year based on your years of service, that's gone. And you know, there's some private agencies, obviously law enforcement, you know, you get 3% of your, your wage at age 50. You know, some you can retire at 55, right. uh, you know, at 2% of, so you know, of your pay every year for service. You know, you can start at age 55. Sure. And so it's much earlier than uh, anything that's really on the private sector today. I know that many cities are looking at or have looked at and passed creating a two-tier system whereby new employees will receive pension benefits that are less attractive than prior employees. I'm sure you know the mayor of San Jose is looking at a plan whereby pensions can be looked at retrospectively. Right. Now the courts have said that can't be done, but we'll, we'll see what happens. I want to talk specifically though about West Covina and its elected officials. So I have said this on the air. I, I honor what you do and Thank I you. honor what <laughs> state assembly members do and state senators do. And as our viewers may know, members of the legislature do not get pensions as a result of the term limit initiative that passed many years ago. Some cities do allow its electeds, even if they're part time, to get benefits, pensions as such. West Covina, though, has an interesting plan in place. Why don't you tell us about it? Well, it's actually very common what West Covina has. And West Covina, you know, uh, council members can participate in a deferred benefit package okay you know where money is put it into an account that they get later like a 401k it's sure a, um, 
that's not the number, but 401k. Right. And then they also get to participate in CalPERS, which is the California Public Employee Retirement System. Okay. So there's a possibility if you work for, uh, or if you're an elected member of the city council in West Covina, or actually almost every city, you end up being able to participate in two different pension or uh, retirement programs. So the first plan is $300 a month in West Covina, gets put aside, you can access it at retirement. Right. But then there's also CalPERS. Correct. But CalPERS takes just a, a slice of, of your salary, which is minimal, correct? Right. It takes a slice, but it also takes a slice from the taxpayers. But the difference uh, from the city, which is taxpayer money, right. but the difference is it's a defined benefit program. So it goes on forever and ever and ever, right. and taxpayers are on the hook for what we know is an already underfunded liability. So, and so you, um, you yeah. looked to have your colleagues on the council change that. Explain exactly what you want to happen. Well, I wanted to know what happened, what happened to school board members. Mm. Prior to 19- You were on the West Covina I was board. on the West Covina School Board member. And prior to 1994, school board members were allowed to be part of CalPERS. And then the state legislature said they're a part-time position. They shouldn't be able to participate in okay. a full-time retirement system like CalPERS. So they ended that. They also ended it for- Believe it or not, people that served on commissions, like planning commissions, actually could participate oh, in CalPERS. So, do they put them into CalSTRS or just CalPERS? But yeah. do they put them into CalSTRS or they? Yeah. Of, oh, they're in CalSTRS. They were. Now. They were. They, no, no, no. Oh. They're out. They're, they're out, out completely. completely. Out okay. completely. They cannot participate. I in a defined benefit package from the state. Okay. Um, that doesn't limit what local people can sure. do, but the defined state part. And so, basically, I wanted to extend that to the West Community City Council. You know, and there's been bills to do this that haven't passed. But basically, if you're a part-time you know, politician or part-time right. elected official, you shouldn't be able to participate in two different uh, benefit sure. packages. And I wanted to eliminate for future council members, so it didn't affect the right. ones that were currently in it, that uh, the city would stop participating in it for uh, council members and, and, you know, stop that. You know, I understand that the amount being saved was very small, except long-term, we don't really know what that amount is because mm. it depends on how long you live. You receive X amount of money right. for until whether you're 85, 90, 95. So what so was I wanted the vote? to end that. Uh, I lost. The vote mm. was uh, two to three. James Toma on the city mm -hmm. council, he seconded my motion that we would eliminate um, this full-time benefit that our part, our part-time council members right. get. And, um, and the other three voted to keep it. What do you think? Oh, I was disappointed. I was hoping that we, I could get a third vote so that we can end it and right. send a message that, you know, we're willing, we understand some of these pension issues. Um, the city of West Covina, you know, I wanted to, to get that statement out there and, right. and uh, get but people to understand what's interesting, it. just to play the other side, is look, you have a full-time job. Right. And you spend, in your off time, a lot of time working on behalf of over 100,000 residents of West Covina. You have two children, teenagers. And so, just to play it out, is it so wrong that you get a little extra upon retirement? Well, you know, the problem is that little extra, uh, the taxpayers are on the hook for it's not money that I put aside in some program. It's, it's stuff the taxpayers are on the hook for. And, and I kind of view it as that I'm supposed to be a public servant. And yeah, I do receive a stipend, and there are stipends that you know other cities, mm -hmm. you know, uh, you people get. get three hundred like bucks that. a month. Something like that, a little more than that. Three eighty. Okay, I don't whatever know it, it is. In. I mean, but, but yeah. it's minuscule. It's minuscule, and this is a major city in the San Gabriel Valley. Over a hundred thousand people. Yeah, and at the same time, I'm willing to serve for that amount of money. Right. And I think having this extra uh, benefit that no one else in the public has access to. I mean, most people don't get two pensions from their their own work, from their own job, and so you know. I'm in it because I wanted to be a servant leader. I didn't want to be someone that was able to get an extra pension out of it. So what do you think happens now? Do you think that the fact you called this issue to the attention of voters, councils, that it will start to gain some momentum and steam? Well, I think, you know, city council perks always end up being an issue in city right. council campaigns. Um, unfortunately, usually people that bring it up when they get elected, they take them anyways. But, <laughs> um, but uh, you know, I think I think it will be an issue. I mean, I think it's it's very possible it will be an issue like, you know, okay, I was willing not to do the Chuck Reed thing and take right. it from people from behind, but, you know. That's uh, Mayor of San Jose. Yeah, Mayor of San Jose's right. uh, proposal. But, you know, just prospectively stop okay. it. His name is Mike Spence with the West Covina City Council. When we come back, Barbara Messina with the Alhambra City Council. I'm Brad Palmer. It's, it's California Edition. From 2010 to 2013, how many municipalities filed for bankruptcy protection? 24, 30, 38, or 48? 38 municipal bankruptcies have been filed from 2010 through 2013. 
Welcome back to Charter California Edition. I'm Brad Pomerantz, and we are joined by Barbara Messina. She is a councilwoman in Alhambra, but she is also the president of the San Gabriel Valley Council of Governments, representing over 2 million residents, 31 cities. Good to see you, Madam President. We Good appreciate to be you back. being here. Good Let's talk about Alhambra briefly. Okay. A lot of awards given to Alhambra for its livability. Tell us about it. Well, we were very, very pleased and surprised. We won two awards. The one was um, nationally in the United States. Um, top, li mo most livable most cities, livable, top 25. Top 25. We were number 21 and Pasadena was 20. Nice, that's okay. Uh, that's okay, uh, we'll take that. Right. And the criteria that they used was based, uh, there were eight um, components right. that they judged and there were 1,700 cities that they surveyed and um, you know. You came out on top. We came out good. It's wonderful. Now speaking of Pasadena, yeah. we know that Alhambra and Pasadena have had a relationship over the last several years that has been a little rocky at times and it really focuses upon the 710 freeway. For our viewers statewide, there is a gap in yes. the 710 freeway between Alhambra and Pasadena going through the city of South Pasadena. Right. Because of that gap, talk to us about the traffic complications. Well, you know, it's, it's, it's a regional issue. We bear the brunt of most of the congestion because all of those cars get off the 710 on Valley Boulevard every day, uh, getting off and getting on. Um, in Alhambra, on a daily basis, you have 72,000 cars on our arterial streets. 12,000 of those daily are on Fremont, which is the main right. drag that they use to get to their northern destination. There is no other choice. There is no other choice. You have to go through the city's uh, our streets, basically. Right. And it's Alhambra, it's San Gabriel, it's Monterey Park, it's Rosemead. Right. It's all of us. And so there has been a lot of discussion about how to close that gap. Should there be a tunnel? Should there be takings of homes to create a freeway on surface streets? I mean, there's so many different options. The surface streets are off the table. Okay, so that's we not... We know that as a yeah. result of a federal ruling, is no, that right? No, it's so a result of compromise on our part. Okay. Uh, when Gil Cedillo was our senator, he brokered a deal with South Pasadena that we would take the surface route off the table if they would support the tunnel. And they said yes, they would support the tunnel. And I have a letter to that effect in 2008 where they said they would support the tunnel. And when they passed that support, once the uh, surface route was taken off the, t off the table, they rescinded their support. Oh I know, so that's what you have. And it's gotta be uh, pretty dicey for you because not only are you a councilwoman in Alhambra, but you're now president of the COG. Yeah. And so obviously you're looking out for all 31 cities exactly. interests. Exactly, exactly. That being said, it seems to be that the tunnel is the most likely scenario. Um, I'm not commenting on the benefits or detriments of it, it's just that's what it seems to be. And so where do we go from here? What's going to happen next? Well, the EIR, EIS will be released this spring, probably April or May. Then there's a public comment period, I think it's 60 days. Um, and. Um, then, <laughs> then well, the rubber meets the road, metaphorically speaking. Well, Caltrans and Metro, Caltrans selects the, the route. Metro has the money, okay? Um, there is money? There is money only for one of the alternatives, and that's the tunnel. Okay. Uh, because it will be financed through a public-private partnership. And this is, this is a common means of, of doing infrastructure financing. Uh, because there's no public money. Will, will there be a toll? Yes. Okay. It's a toll and the company putting up the money collects the toll, maintains the tunnel, um, and they retain uh, 
ownership of it for the length of the contract, if it's 30 years or 40 right. years, then they turn it over. Will the toll be affordable? I mean, or would it be prohibitive? I would hope no, it would be affordable. No, I'm sure they're affordable. Right. I mean, there are tolls all over. Right. And, Although uh, we don't have that same experience as, as if we lived in New York or exactly. Connecticut or New Jersey, where, where you, you know, they're used to tolls yeah. everywhere. Yeah. You know, this is a new experience well, for this, Angelinos. This, this is a way of the future. I mean, it's not only, you know, highway projects, it's, it's, uh, high speed rail, it's, it's, <laughs> that could it's, be public private, it's port projects, right. any major infrastructure project is, is going to be looking for a public private partnership for financing. And so when do you believe that we will see ground broken on the fix for the 710 gap? You've been working on this for, God, 30 years. I, I you personally, personally have. Right? Um, I would realistically think that um, within a two-year period, really? you it's, would it's see It's going it. to happen. Yeah. And the tunnel is going to be pretty long, somewhere around five, six miles. Does that take a long time to build? I mean, that's a long, that's a big tunnel. Well, I've heard now f uh, three to five years to build the tunnel. Okay. Yeah. So it couldn't happen soon enough, though? Yeah. Okay. I want to <laughs> talk to you as well about development in your city. Okay. Because we know that so much of the way cities in our region have flourished is through uh, developing areas that may have been blighted, may have been more challenged. Uh, cities did have a redevelopment tool that went away. That being said, Alhambra is still looking to toward development. So talk to us about some of the things that Alhambra has done well, on the, the devel development front. The development that we currently have undergoing um, was um, put in place before we lost redevelopment. Right, amen okay. to that, I'm sure. So now we're seeing the construction part of those projects. But but we were, we were proactive and as soon as we lost redevelopment, we, we um, put an economic development right. ordinance in place, which enables us then to move forward with some of the tools that you have with economic development. Which are what? Because redevelopment was such a specific tool, and I'm not sure if you had enterprise zones, but that tool we is now yeah. dramatically uh, revamped. Well, you can do tax rebates. Um, there's a number of right. things that, that you can do. And have you been successful in using tools other than redevelopment to lure business in? We haven't as of yet, right. okay, because we're busy finishing what we had on the front burner. Have you had to fight with Sacramento to be permitted to finish what you had. Oh, it's a constant fight <laughs> with Sacramento. I mean, it is, we know that, I think it was Pasadena and Burbank wound up in a lawsuit well, over the question. we're still fighting with the Department of Finance right. to, to let us go forward with projects that we had in the hopper right. that the businesses are, are waiting to start. Right. Uh, but the Department of Finance hasn't released those projects. The question became for the, the Department of Finance, was the project already in the pipeline? And at what point did a city put it in the pipeline? Because we know some cities tried to rush projects yeah, no, into the pipeline. Yeah. That was not no, uh, the experience these, these of Alhambra. Were, these were projects. And what they fail to realize is that you, you have encumbered um, um, bond indebtedness, bond indebted, indebtedness mm. that, that you have to, you have to uh, pay. respect and pay and uh, you know, we have a project right now across the street from our Costco mm -hmm. that's just ready to go, and uh, can't do anything with it. Can't. We have to wait until Sacramento releases. We've done everything that they've asked with our ropes and our ROPs, and you know. What is that? Uh, what What are ropes or ROPs? Or well, those are all of the the financials that they want, right. and we've done that. Right. You know. So it's a long process. They, they've created a mess. I mean, okay. They, they Her just, name is Barbara know, Messina. Yeah. She is the councilwoman, a councilwoman from Alhambra, also president of the San Gabriel Valley COG. My name is Brad Pomerantz. We thank you so much for watching Charter California Edition.